Good morning. Welcome to Stand on the Word. Our journey today takes us to 1 Kings chapters 5 and 6, verse 12 of chapter 6, concerning this temple which you are building. If you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father, David. Chapter 5 is focused on the source of materials that were used in the construction of the temple, primarily the wood that was needed, which came from Phoenicia. Phoenicia bordered Israel on the northwest along the Mediterranean Sea. Let's begin in, in, begin in verse 1, chapter 5. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always loved David. Then Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side, until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. Now, interestingly, this uh, description here of the wars that David fought, look, look what it says. They were fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. David was not the aggressor. It's very interesting. We see this today, uh, even right now as we speak. Israel's not the aggressor. And this goes back in part, as we've talked about before, Solomon uh, acquiring the chariots and the horses. God did not want them, number one, to rely on a military industrial complex, but also did not want them to be a warring nation. They were to be a nation that sought peace. And um, they needed to depend on God and the strength of God to bring that peace about. Verse 4, chapter 5. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I, I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name. Now therefore command that they cut down cedars for me from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants according to whatever you say. For you know there is none among us who has skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. So it was when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, for he has given David a wise son over this great people. Then Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the message which you sent me, and I will do all you desire concerning the cedar and the cypress logs. While most of the gold and the other extremely valuable materials needed to build the house for the name of the Lord had been acquired by David, Solomon uh, did not have everything he needed to accomplish what God had called him to do, but God did. God is the creator of all things. He ultimately controls all things as well. And God can and will provide what we need to accomplish accomplish what he wants us to do, even if it is in the hands of the world. That's why it's beneficial for us to operate and understand God's economy. And we need to understand God's economy and operate in God's economy because it knows no boundaries. Chapter 6 is the construction of the temple, which began about 480 years after the children of Israel came out of Egypt. This was four years into the reign of Solomon, and it took seven years to build the temple. The temple then remained for uh, about 400 years before it was destroyed, along with Jerusalem, in 587 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar uh, destroyed the city. Verse 1, chapter 6, And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now, the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, its length was 60 cubits, its width 20, and its height 30 cubits. Now, the size of the cubit used in constructing the temple is believed to be equivalent to uh, 20.9 inches. So if you do the math, it's not an an extremely large building relative to some of the other temples that were build, built in that day. However, we see from the description of the interior that it was elaborate. Verse 20, the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. He overlaid it with pure gold and overlaid the altar of cedar. So Solomon overlaid the inside of the temple with pure gold. He stretched gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. The whole temple he overlaid with gold 
until he had finished all the temple. Also he overlaid with gold the entire altar that was by the inner sanctuary. All right, so in the middle of this chapter, the word of the Lord was delivered to Solomon, most likely through a prophet. And it was a, I would say, a, a sobering message, which if I can summarize, it would be this. Don't forget the main thing, Solomon. Verse 11, Then the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning the temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments, and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Now, it, it wasn't the fact that there was going to be this house of God that would determine their future, as the prophet Jeremiah later warned before the fall of Jerusalem. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 4, he said this, Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. There were those that thought just because they had a temple, they were protected, like it was some kind of, uh, you know, like a rabbit's foot. Uh, it, 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 they eventually rejected God's instruction to obey His Word. But they thought as long as they had the temple, a form of religion, that they were fine. But they found out it's not about the house of God. It's not about a building. It's not about religion. Rather, it's about living in relationship with God. And the same is true for us today. It's not about going to church. It's not about being baptized. It's about living in relationship with God which comes about through Jesus Christ. No man, no man comes to the Father but by, by me, Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So there, this promise here was conditional. It was one of those if then. So he says, if you walk in my statutes, uphold my judgments, and keep my commandments. Three things. Now this looks and sounds repetitive, but there are three different aspects of walking in the way of the Lord. The statutes are related to the religious Ordinances are rituals, the feast. The judgments are related to the execution of justice for the people in the law, upholding justice. And the commandments are the moral law of God. And they all go together. They all go together. And so then he says, if you do this, then I will perform my promise, perform my promise to David. What was that? Well, that Solomon, or that David would have someone, a son that would sit on the throne, that he would continue. Now, the second is, I will dwell among you. My presence will be with you. You recall when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness up to the promised land, and God says, well, I'm going to, see, after he had had enough of them, he said, I'm going to send my angel. And, and Moses said, wait a minute. No, we want you. If your presence does not go, we, we don't want to go. The presence of God, that's what made them different. The presence of God. They had the presence of God in their midst. It's what makes us different. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus Christ dwelling with the people. And we have the Holy Spirit today. So, and then he says, I will not forsake you. We've heard that before. Jesus said the same thing. I will never forsake you. All right, verse 23. Inside the inner temple sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. One wing of the cherub was five cubits, the other wing of the cherub five cubits, ten cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. And the other cherub was ten cubits. Both cherubim were of the same size and shape. The height of one cherub was ten cubits, and so the, was the other. Now, just for context, the wings of the cherub tip to tip were 17.5 feet. They were 17 and a half feet tall. Pretty big, all right? Throughout the temple, we see three carved objects, okay, repeatedly. We see the cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. So what is the significance of these things? Does it have any meaning? Well, first off, God doesn't doodle, all right? There is nothing in God's design that does not have purpose and meaning. The, and, and this is one of the things you can do. There's so many layers to scriptures. We look through these things and comb through them to, to see the meaning, and, and this is where we miss a lot uh, until we study kind of Jewish history and tradition, a lot of this is that these layers uh, become very clear when we do that. So the cherubim are about the worship and the power of God. Th they, they were not the objects of worship. They were not idols. They were not to be worshiped, but they represented the servants in the attendance of Almighty God. 
The palm trees, they represent life, provision, and rest. It is the fruitfulness in a desert place. Palm trees thrive in places where other plants struggle. You know, in God we find life and meaning in a very unhospitable place, i.e. the world. The open flowers um, are actually interesting. There's not much written about the open flowers. It is uncertain what kind of flowers they were and what their meaning was. Um, flowers, like the palms, can represent life, but in Scripture when we see flowers, it generally emphasizes the brevity of life. And so I think that was a part of understanding their mortality in the light of eternity. Our lives are short, like an open flower, but eternal life can only be found in God and we will stand before Him and give an account for what we do in this short life as we face eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that just as this message was given to Solomon, not to, to focus on the wrong thing. It's not the edifice, it's not the religion, but it's the relationship. May we walk in obedience to you, in relationship with you. And Father, I, I pray that um, we would walk in the fullness of the understanding of what you've done through us through, G through Jesus Christ and that relationship that we can have with our Creator. And so, Father, thank you for your word. May the Holy Spirit continue to guide us and teach us on this journey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, one final thing I want to encourage you. Some of you are within driving distance of Washington, D.C. Coming up October the 3rd through the 6th, right around the corner, the Pray, Vote, Stand Summit. We've kind of shifted gears a little bit, given the urgency of this hour, and I want to invite you to come and join us. We're going to be starting Thursday night with a praise and worship and, and, and several messages that are going to be delivered as we, we cry out to God to rend the heavens and come down in this moment. I believe there is a lot hanging in the balance. And frankly, an election is not going to solve our problems. Our problems are much deeper than that. So join us October the 3rd through the 6th here in Washington, D.C. for the Pray, Vote, Stand Summit. To find out more, you can go to prayvotestand.org. All right, until next time, keep standing on the Word.